name's Chris Jarvis, and I'm one of the people lucky enough to work here in Oxford University's Museum of Natural History. Now, when most people think about natural history museums, they think about dinosaurs. <laughs> now that's fine because, well, we do have dinosaurs and we are quite famous for them. In fact, in this museum, you can see this, which is the first ever bit of any dinosaur ever discovered and described anywhere in the world, the Megalosaurus. But actually, we have seven million things within these walls, and most of them are not dinosaurs. In fact, five million of them are insects. And if you knew our collections and could walk around behind the scenes, you'd probably be thinking about this Natural History Museum more as a museum of bugs. Now, insects belong to the largest group of animals on our planet, a group of animals we call the arthropods. And within the arthropods, we have several groups. There are the crustaceans, crabs, prawns, lobsters, those sorts of things. The arachnids, the spiders and scorpions with eight legs. Then we have the many-legged animals, the centipedes and the millipedes, what we call the myriapods. And the largest group of arthropods are the insects. Now, they all look very different, but they do share several things in common. All of our arthropods have jointed legs and they all have a hard skeleton on the outside of their body, like a suit of armour. It's called an exoskeleton. So what makes insects different from other arthropods? Well, here at the museum, we don't just have dead insects. We also have some live little friends that might help us find out. So, to be an insect, although you have an exoskeleton and jointed legs like the other arthropods, you do have to have a certain type of body. You have to have three bits of your body. So all insects have a head, a thorax, which is where all the big muscles are on the insects, and an abdomen, which is basically where its tummy is. And the other thing all insects have is six legs. So you might be asking right now, how do you catch insects? I mean, they're tiny and they move really, really quickly. Well, there are several easy ways to catch insects. And the way that scientists normally use them is, well, there are lots of methods, lots of equipment, things like butterfly nets for catching flying insects, always very good. If you're going for things living in long grass or uh, stiff bushes, you need something a bit more robust like this beating net, which is a butterfly net, but with a much stiffer edge and a big strong rod down the middle, so you can really whack it through those grasses and actually catch everything in there. What about things living in trees and bushes? Well, we have these in the museum, which are fantastic little beating traps. But all it really is, is a white sheet on a frame. You can get a white sheet, you stick it underneath a tree, and then you spend a good couple of minutes having some fun, bashing the tree like mad until all the insects fall out onto your sheet. And then you can see what you've got. Obviously, they're gonna run away quickly. So what you need to do to study them nice and closely is get yourself a jam jar or even a nice clear plastic freezer bag like this. Scoop them into there, close it up, your insects will be alive, and you can have a really good look at them. See what you've got, look at the variety, look at the numbers, look at where they live, which insects you catch and which bits in your garden, and then obviously you can let them go. The museum, though, if we're doing a proper scientific study, we might not let them go. We might have to keep them. And a lot of people say, well, that's a bit cruel. I mean, here are some insects that I've caught myself. And I've already explained that actually the data is really important for our collections and it helps us ask lots of questions and discover a lot about the world that we live on. But people say, why do you put them on pins? Well, insects are very delicate things. And if I wanted to pick up this bee here, I'd probably break it with my big clumsy fingers. If we have it on a pin though, I can simply take the pin, pull it off, and I can look all the way around it without actually ever having to touch it or damage it in any way. And because our curators here at the museum look after all of these millions of insects on their pins so well, we have the oldest pinned insect in the world in this museum. It's a bath white butterfly that was caught in Cambridgeshire about 320 years ago. They're looking after it so well, we hope 
your descendants will be able to come and look at it in another 320 years from now. And their descendants, 320 years after that, and they'll be able to ask questions about the environment that butterfly was caught in and the changes around us that we see in the planet. Well, insects aren't just scientifically fascinating. Actually, people have used them as inspiration for all sorts of art through the ages as well. Producing beautiful paintings of things like butterflies, turning them into wonderful prints like this beetle on this cushion cover. They've made sculptures, carvings, even wonderful images like this to cover beautiful scarves and other bits of clothing. And this has been going on for a very long time. As far back as ancient Egypt, people were using insects as inspiration for their art, decorating tombs and temples with things like grasshoppers, butterflies, bees. They even gave their soldiers necklaces of golden flies to represent their bravery and persistence. And one insect they even turned into a god. The god Kepri, the giant dung beetle god who pushed the sun across the sky every day like a great ball of poo. And this was turned into amulets and charms like the one you can see here. And now over to an artist who's found inspiration amongst the insects, who's going to show you just how to make some insect-based art yourself. Now it's time to find out from Sue how to make your own buff-tailed bumblebee, and I'll be back with more insect facts later. Hello, I'm Groovy Sue, I'm a community artist, and I'm going to show you how to make a bee. Okay, so this is an insect. This is a buff-tailed bumblebee, all made from waste materials and I'm going to show you how to make it. The tools you'll need are a ruler, a pair of scissors, a black marker pen, some sellotape, and you will need at one point a sharp knife and an adult to help. So go find your adult because you're going to need them. Okay. Okay, so you'll notice at the bottom of your bottle you've got sort of like some peaks and troughs. You're going to measure with a ruler so if you make a mark there with the pen, you're going to measure six centimetres up and ten centimetres up. And each time you get to one of those dips, you do the same. Right, so you've got marks going all the way around. And what it would be good to do is to join up the top mark, like I said, you don't have to be super accurate, but you're trying to get roughly a line going around like so. And this is where you're going to need your grown up to help you. Right, I found myself a grown up and what you're going to need is a cut made on that 10 centimetre line. So if my grown up would help me now. Right. So you can see it's a bit tricky. And the grown-up's going to have to be careful too. <laughs> okay, right. And so now you've got a hole. If you could make the mark at the hole a bit bigger. You've got a hole to get you started on your cutting out of your bottle. So your grown-up can now take away the sharp knife because you're not going to need it again. Okay, so now what you need to do using your scissors is cut around on the 10 centimetre line, you're going to go all the way around and cut it off. Right, so now what you're going to do is you're going to cut down to your 6 centimetre line. And with those five flaps, you're going to bend them over and crease them so that you end up making this part actually is the going to be the abdomen of your bumblebee. So this part we've created is the abdomen. This part and the smaller bottle fits inside to create the thorax. And then we're going to use a couple of bottle lids on the end fixed on sellotape, uh, which I'm going to get. Uh, 
So when you're fixing on your bottle lids, make sure you get your sellotape to go down onto the plastic well. So creased in like that. I'm doing it four times in the corners. Corners. So I'm now going to add another bottle top lid. It's just to make it stick out a bit further. It doesn't have to look beautiful at this stage. You're just trying to create a basic shape. And I just found on the model that I made to start with that this kind of worked. Okay. So this is your, believe it or not, your basic shape of your bee body. Uh, um, this is the abdomen, thorax and head and you're going to need some bubble wrap to pad it and create a bit of curve to it. So bubble wrap works best but obviously if you haven't got bubble wrap you can also use um, plastic ripped up and scrunched up. So I'm going to go and do a bit of work off camera now to fix that in place but to give you the idea you're wedging it down into there. Okay. Okay, so what I'm doing is cutting the bubble wrap into strips so it's easier to work with. Um, I'll show you what it's like with bubble wrap and with plastic bags. So basically you're just going round so there's a bit more curve, you get rid of the sharp edges, but you still want to keep the shape. I just need a bit of sellotape to hold it in place. Same with the plastic, um, you need strips of it. You can rip it into bits. Oops. But obviously, because it's not so padded, you're going to have to use a bit more. So now what I'm trying to do is pad this out a bit. And every now and then you're going to have to get a bit of sellotape to hold things in place. And just keep working on it until you're happy with the shape that you've got. And just go round and round a few times. Hold it in place with sellotape. Okay, and I might just do a tiny bit more off camera and then come back to you.